I share the screen. Uh, you can start now if you want. All right, I'll, I'll just set it. Okay, guys. Hello, everybody. Just one more minute and we'll get started, okay? Okay, well, it's six o'clock, so um, welcome everybody uh, to our online talk series. Um, I would like to present to you guys Brittany Ober, uh, who has been teaching at Columbia University at the American Language Program since 2012. At the ALP, she teaches various levels in the Intensive English Program, Advanced Academic Preparation, and Academic Writing at the School for International and Public Affairs. Since 2015, she has been the co-chair of ALP's annual winter conference for TESOL professionals. Uh, Brittany's pedagogical interests include extensive listening, critical thinking, and incorporating art, poetry, and music into ESL instruction. Her recent professional projects include presenting at the Anupi Conference in Huatulco, Mexico, uh, co-teaching a teacher training seminar on English medium instruction at the Uni uh, Universidad Panamericana in Guadalajara, and writing project-based language learning courses for the ALP's new summer curriculum. Uh, well, uh, this is Brittany Ober, guys. My name is Leo Rivas. I'm going to be your host today. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us, Brittany. Uh, and please go ahead and take over. Sure. Thank you so much, Leo, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks for having me. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for attending this evening. Um, as Leo said, my name is Brittany Ober, and I am a lecturer at the American Language Program. We are part of the School of Professional Studies at Columbia University. There are a lot of names, a lot of um, schools, but I just want to make sure my affiliation is accurate. So um, tonight I'm going to present to you reflections on the pivot to remote teaching. Um, when Leo invited me to do this talk, we discussed how quickly we found ourselves in a remote teaching context as um, educators in the spring of this year. And I'm sure that your email inboxes have been inundated with trainings and webinars and other professional development opportunities as my inbox has as well. Um, many of us as teachers, we really just want to do our best for our students and we attended so many different um, online trainings and many of these webinars to prepare for our classes but things were happening in the moment at lightning speed. And so today I just wanna slow down a little bit, look back at what our institutions did and what we as educators can take away from the experience. And so first I'm gonna share our plan for tonight. Um, I'll discuss my program's context and the recap of what happened in the spring semester. How did we get to remote learning? I'll also talk about the remote experience with some feedback from students and some feedback from teachers in my faculty and other friends in New York City. And then we'll talk about the reflection component. I'll give you some what I perceive to be the benefits and the challenges of remote instruction. And then I'll share with you what I think the takeaways are. Um, after the talk, there'll be some time for Q&A. And if you have any question along the way, it, you can type it into the chat and I will address your question at the end of the talk. So first I'll share a little bit about the ALP. Um, the American Language Program is part of Columbia's main campus, which is in the heart of Morningside Heights or Harlem. And we're really the only physical campus in New York City. 
So I mentioned that not to brag, but to let you know that for students, when they come to Columbia, being on the physical campus is a major part of what drew them to want to come to the university. And so when that was ripped away from them, it was very dramatic, which I'll talk about later. Um, in our program, we have two different sides to what we do. One of the sides is we teach part-time courses for different schools at the university. Um, so I usually teach an academic writing class at SEPA, the School for International and Public Affairs. And we have various other classes like this. Most of them are academic writing classes. Um, those students are degree candidates. And so they are taking our class as part of their normal course load. But most of what we do at the ALP is part of an intensive English program where students are coming from all over the world and they are in a non-degree program. So we have um, students coming from Saudi Arabia, South Korea, China, Japan, Turkey, Italy, Spain, sometimes Mexico, and various other places. And they're in all different levels. We do have levels two through nine in our program. Um, that would correlate to a common European framework of reference um, A2 to C1.2. In basic English, it's a, it's a high beginner level to a high advanced level. Um, so we have a lot of different kinds of students and they also come for different reasons. Some of them come for academic reasons. They want to go to um, undergraduate or graduate programs in the US. And some of them come for professional reasons. They're trying to learn English for something in their jobs. And then we also get students who come for totally personal reasons, just for enrichment. And so we have a mix of their motivations as well as where they come from and what level they are. Um, in our program, the students will meet for 18 hours a week. And the teams uh, who teach them, it's usually three teachers. So one teacher will meet with them for nine hours, another teacher six hours, and another teacher three hours to get to that 18. Um, that in requires a lot of planning to integrate and sequence the lessons with the team teachers. And so that's also th something to keep in mind about the pivot to remote learning. We had to you know, keep integrating our lessons and work with each other. Our classes usually have between eight to 15 students, um, depending on enrollment and depending on what level they're in. And that's kind of where we were when we had to start changing. So what happened in spring 2020 in New York City? Um, this is a photo of Times Square um, subway station. This is the I believe it's the seven train platform. And I'm showing you this picture just to kind of um, bring the drama of what happened to the forefront. So I have never in my life in New York, and I've been here for 13 years now, I've never seen a platform look like this on any subway um, station. But this is what happened in spring. And so we really had a crazy difference take over our lives in all levels. Um, and I'll come back to this photo and discuss it in a few minutes. But in spring 2020, um, I was teaching two classes. The first one was academic writing for the School of General Studies. And so these students were um, getting college credit to take the class and it, it only focused on writing. And then the other class that I was teaching was the lowest level in our intensive English program. And so these students um, had just arrived to campus in January. And I would say um, beginning on January 21st, the attitude, the atmosphere on campus, it was kind of like anxiety was at a, a simmer. People were aware of coronavirus, um, especially certain students who had just arrived from China. They were very concerned. They were asking a lot of questions such as, should I wear a mask? Should I come to class if I feel sick? And we were just following the guidelines that we had at the time. So for instance, we were told in New York City that washing our hands and staying home if we felt sick were the two best ways to avoid um, getting the illness or spreading COVID-19. And we were also told you don't need to wear a face mask. Don't worry about it. It's OK. That's just for healthcare professionals. Um, things started changing pretty rapidly through the semester. The last time I saw my students was on March 4th. And I remember leaving campus that day and, and that week was really uh, that low simmer was getting to a kind of low boil. We were all nervous to go on the subway. Our students were 
checking the news all the time uh, with her home countries. And in my lower lower level class, we were doing a news project where we read the newspaper in English and almost all of the articles were about the coronavirus. And so it was really kind of um, getting to a head at that point. On March 9th, uh, the president of Colombia, Lee Bollinger, announced to everyone through an email that we should not report to campus that next uh, Monday, which was the next day. And we are going to take two days off to do some online training to pivot our classes to the remote learning situation. Um, so my students started emailing me immediately, oh my gosh, what should we do? We have a test tomorrow. And I decided to hold the test um, as a take home essay. I didn't know what to do. So that's what I decided to do. Um, what ended up happening is that we went back to, to classes online for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of that first week. And then the next week of class was canceled. At that point, students were advised to go home if they could. For some international students, that was impossible. And uh, that because of either their country's uh, requirements for travel or because they couldn't get airline tickets. Tickets uh, prices were being inflated and students really had to make tough de decisions to stay or to go rapidly. Um, in, on March 17th, New York City basically shut down. So Governor Cuomo closed all of the public school system. We also didn't have any more restaurant dining. Um, public transportation was something that people were really trying to avoid. And so I'm coming back to this photo uh, of the seven train to really show you how how the students experience of coming to Columbia, finally getting admission to the school that they really wanted to go to and then having that taken away from them. I feel like this photo reflects that inner feeling of most of the students. Um, they were emotionally exhausted. They were physically isolated in many cases. Some of them were not allowed to go home. They were mentally drained and really they were spiritually defeated. Um, it was a very kind of dark time. So when they would come on Zoom, I always wanted to check on them. Are you guys okay? And some of them were kind of honest and said, not really. So it just was a really dramatic time and chaotic time for many of the students. But what about teachers? So my director likes to say that we were building the plane while flying it. Um, this image is, you know, it's kind of supposed to be funny. I know it's not really funny, but it comes from um, rich white men laughing.com. And it's a picture of former president um, George H.W. Bush. And I believe that's Ronald Reagan. It says, and then I told the teachers they had to build a plane while flying it. And that is kind of what happened. Um, I'm not trying to blame my university or any other school in any place, because really, what were we supposed to do? Um, but teachers were, were freaking out in this moment. Some teachers we found out didn't really know how to use technology. Surprise, surprise. Some teachers were just uncomfortable using technology. Some teachers were more comfortable than others, but we, we did have a lot of issues. Um, for students, the expectations that they had about our classes were really severely unmet. Um, as much as we tried our best to, to replicate our physical classrooms in the online space, there just were certain things that were going to be different. Um, some students withdrew from the program immediately. Uh, they were afraid to get sick and they wanted to go home. And so our class sizes went down kind of substantially in some cases. In my lower level class, I went to five students. And so that affects many choices that we as teachers would make. Um, the students who did go home, some of them went to very different time zones. So students who live in South Korea, for instance, are 13 hours ahead of us here. And that made, you know, getting them to class sometimes difficult because it would be in the middle of the night. We also had students who went home and then faced quarantine mandates. So they were for 14 days living, most of them in their parents' basements or in hotels. And the internet, especially in the hotels, was almost um, completely unreliable. And so for them to attend class, it was extremely difficult. Um, we also recognize that students face a lot of different gaps. Some of them have a completely amazing technological setup. Some students are sharing one computer with the whole family. And so this really brought to light some inequality that our students face that we that we knew existed, but that wasn't as apparent in the physical classroom. Um, 
there's also inequality in the space that people actually live in. So if you're in New York City and you're living in a studio apartment, that apartment could be about 350 square feet. And I'm sorry, I don't know it in meters. Um, but this is an extremely small space that you're trying to live in, sleep in, and now work in. And this affects people's um, capacity to learn. So as teachers, we saw this happening and we didn't really have any solution for it in the moment. Um, so as I mentioned, some teachers really didn't know tech and we had to do a lot of extensive training, which thankfully was offered to us, but it took a lot of time. And then with the Zoom itself, the classes are just much slower than they are in a physical space. Um, so we had to kind of cut some of the things that we wanted to cover in the classes. And at the very beginning of the Zoom experience, we had to um, either encounter or be wary of what's called Zoom bombing. Zoom bombing is when, uh, well, it happened before Zoom uh, started using passwords to protect meetings, but people would come in the classrooms and they would share pornography on their screens or they might write some racist or inappropriate language in the chat. And this happened to some of my students, not in my class, but in a different class. And it was, they really didn't appreciate that experience. Now, thankfully, Zoom has updated its security and that's not so much a threat anymore. But at the beginning, it really was um, a chaotic experience for all people involved. Now, all that being said, I do think there are some benefits of remote instruction. The first thing I would say is that we still had instruction. So if you can imagine if this had happened 10 years prior or maybe 15 years prior, we wouldn't have had any classes. We would have had to cancel our semesters. So it was great that we still had class. Um, and it was also great that we didn't have to get sick. Um, I'm thankful for that. Another benefit teaching the writing class for me was virtually the same. So I think for some classes, especially maybe one skill classes, it wasn't going to be as difficult of a switch to make. Um, in that writing class, it was discussion based and we did a lot of readings at home and then come in, do some writing exercises and we were really able to make it work. Uh, for putting the agenda in your course management system. I found this to be extremely helpful for remote instruction. And I would put the agenda at the beginning of the class and at the end of the class, we would review, did we cover all these things? What, did, what do you remember and what questions do you still have? So I found this to be really easy to do in remote instruction and it's now become a kind of habit for me, which it never was before. I thought that using breakout rooms in Zoom were really great. Um, that was one thing I was worried about when we first made this switch was like how would students actually get to discuss with each other and using breakout rooms or other small um, ways to have them discuss it was very very helpful to keep the communication flowing in, in a communicative language class. The chat box function in Zoom was really great because if students were working in those breakout rooms they could put their work that they were producing together into the chat box. And then we could all look at it together as a class when we when we came back together. It was also great to have students be able to um, write in the chat box if their audio wasn't working well, or maybe they just didn't feel like they could interrupt someone if they had a question. So the chat box I thought was an awesome component. Um, gallery view. This is something where you can actually see all of the people in the room. Um, unfortunately, I can't see anyone really right now, but if we were in Zoom, I'd be able to see all of you and I would be able to see um, if someone was maybe falling asleep or if somebody had a question or has some kind of confused look. And so the gallery view was really great. Uh, screen sharing. This was something that was awesome because not only can teachers share their screen, but students can as well. And so when they're working together in smaller groups, that one of them can kind of take the lead and use the screen share to keep track of what they're doing together. Um, maybe typing in a Google Doc or a Word document and uh, maybe even just to show something. So a lot of the time in the lower level class I was in, we used screen sharing to kind of just get some image um, support. If we're teaching vocabulary or discussing something and some students didn't know, we would just find a picture, share the screen. And this was really helpful. 
um, polls is another thing that I thought was really cool once I learned how to do it. Um, you can set up some polls in Zoom before your classes begin, and then your students can answer them anonymously. So I use this a lot for um, making decisions with my classes. Um, things had to change in regard to testing. And so many times I would ask them, what is your preference? And then they could answer in a poll. Things also had to change a lot with due dates and we use polls to kind of negotiate that. And students, were, because it was anonymous, they were um, not uncomfortable sharing what they really felt. And the last thing about the benefits of remote instruction are that uh, you can record the classes. So if you do have a student who shows up a little bit late, or maybe they're in that 13 hour different time zone, um, the recording of the classes can help them to go back and catch up on anything that they missed, or it can just exist as a text. So um, I'm a big person for extensive listening, and that's when you kind of just listen to something for a long time in a more relaxed way. If you have a class that exists in the Zoom universe and students want to go back and review it again, I don't think that hurts anything. It, it actually will um, improve listening fluency. So Zoom is perfect, right? No. A lot of challenges. <laughs> so the biggest challenge that I would say um, hit me really hard was like the unknown experience of students at, the, at this time. Some students did come out and just say, you know, this is depressing for me. I don't feel like myself. But I, I think probably students um, felt things that we didn't know about. And I also think probably that we had students who maybe got COVID-19. In New York, it was just such um, a rapidly spreading illness. And we don't know what happened to our students. We don't know if someone in their household may have gotten it. We don't know if their family members at home may have gotten it. And so I, I took this to just kind of um, remind myself to take it easy on them and to give them some flexibility because we didn't know what they were going through. Um, there was a huge difference for the IEP class that I, that I taught. So that's the class that went down to five students. And to get them to talk in with only five students, um, a lot of the times I was typing what they were saying in a Word document and sharing my screen because we had issues with audio. We had um, one student who was went home to Saudi Arabia and he kept getting kicked off the internet connection and things just really slowed down in that class. So it wasn't as great of a transition as the writing class. We learned um, kind of the hard way that the private chat is not private in Zoom. Um, if you type something to your teacher privately or to another student at the end of the Zoom session, your teacher gets a download of the whole transcript. And um, I just started my summer class on Monday morning and I told this to my, to my students and I said, you know, I just want to remind you private chat is not private. One of the students got bright red and started cracking up because apparently in his first summer class, he had been um, kind of talking smack on his teacher the whole, <laughs> the whole time and he didn't know that she could read it. So I think it's good to remind students of this because you don't want any um, awkward situations. And I'm not sure if other students get that download, but it, just in case it's good for them to know. There is a time lag when you send students to breakout rooms and we have had experience where someone kind of gets lost in the ether of Zoom and we don't really know where they go. We, we are able to get them back, but sometimes that, that time lag, you don't know where the students actually go. So that's a little weird, but it usually doesn't happen. Another thing that's kind of a challenge is giving error correction. Um, so if I'm in the classroom and I hear an error, I'm able to correct it easily in a multiple in multiple ways. I can write it on the board. I can address it immediately. I can come back to it later. I can give the student a little post-it note at the desk. But in the Zoom room, um, you know, the the best way that I found was just to type it, share it discuss it as a group. So it kind of cuts down on how much you can actually correct with your students, which I don't really have a problem with, but it was something I had to kind of develop a new way of, of doing. 
Another challenge is that sometimes students don't share their video. Um, I don't know if it's because they're like lying in bed and they don't want to get out of bed to come to class. Um, but again, because of all these different time zone issues and, and the unknown factor in the spring semester, I didn't mandate that they share their video. For the summer semester, I am mandating it because they knew what they were getting into when they signed up for the class. But it is a little bit weird to teach a series of black boxes that just have names on them. You, you have no way of that human connection that's so important for teachers. Um, students can't always attend class. That's not always their fault in this context because sometimes the internet just isn't working. And I have heard that with the stress of, of basically schools across the world joining on Zoom and, and Google Meet and other platforms, the internet really has um, slowed down for some people. Now, assessment is something I would rather just not talk about. That's how difficult it is to do uh, remotely. But we had to assess our students um, because they were getting um, grades at the end of our spring semester. It was a pass fail, thankfully, but we did have to have some kind of um, data that showed that they passed the class. Um, so a lot of the writing teachers use Google Docs and they had the test um, right in the Zoom room so they could go into each individual Google Doc and make sure that the student wasn't copying and pasting anything. Um, we also tried out Proctorio as a program. I don't really have experience with it because my students didn't need that. But giving a listening exam, for example, on the internet is very, very difficult. And so right now I'm currently thinking of um, how to use portfolio assessment instead of the traditional exams that we usually use because I think it's a little bit of a better fit with this type of teaching. The last thing is about recording classes. So yes, that's great, but are there privacy concerns? I'm not really sure. Um, I do like to remind the students that they will be recorded. Um, again, you don't want anyone running around uh, your space that's maybe not dressed or not dressed appropriately, which could have happened um, in the past. Yeah, it did happen. So I like to tell my students, just be mindful this is going to be recorded. And the other thing is, um, if your class starts at 9 a.m. and your student arrives in the Zoom room at 8.50, they are being recorded the whole time. So if they're sitting there, like, you know, doing their makeup in the um, video of their computer that's going to be on the on the recording which is a little bit embarrassing so I do also think it's important to tell them hey come to the zoom room ready to go don't do your grooming on the computer and these are the challenges that I face there are probably many others but let's look at some of the feedback so Zoom classes for the students, they just weren't the same. And this comes from my direct feedback that my students gave me, but also from a survey that Columbia sent out at the end of the spring semester. It had a pretty low um, completion rate, but the biggest takeaway from that survey was that the Zoom classes just were not the same. Um, however, the students were extremely grateful. Um, they they were just thankful that they didn't have to stop their classes. Uh, they were they saw the dedication that the teachers were putting in and the things that we were doing to to try to keep the, the classes flowing. They were very grateful. They appreciated flexibility. So I mentioned um, that I was kind of delaying every single due date and changing assessment to be more of a take home experience. And they appreciated that they were very grateful. Um, distribution of materials. So something that, you know, I never really had to think about before. I would just print out papers for them and give them to them. But in the online world, some people prefer docs and some people prefer PDFs so they can write on them with the, you know, tablet and the pencil. And so um, I learned very quickly that just provide both. It's the best way to go forward for them. Students were incredibly um, grateful for meetings on Zoom one-on-one -on -one or maybe in small groups and any extra support. Um, they, I think that they liked the socialization even if it was really just with your teacher, which you know is kind of weird, but um, in this world, it was actually like hanging out with someone. And in New York, we, we couldn't hang out with anyone other than in the online space. So they appreciated that. The last thing is, not, it's not about anything teachers could do, but students across the United States were incredibly 
frustrated because they did not receive tuition um, discounts or refunds. And a lot of students were upset with the decisions of many universities to go to a pass fail grading system. Um, my students who actually were you know, affected by that the most were the advanced writing students. And so what I had them do was I changed the topic of their last argument synthesis essay to be about this issue. Um, how did universities respond? And so we read a series of um, news articles that were being published every single day. And then they wrote their final essay for the class about what was happening to them. And I actually received some of the best essays I've ever received um, because I think they were just so emotionally invested in what was happening. And they were very, um, actually, some of them really defended the universities and said they can't give us the money back because if they do, where are they going to get it and who are they going to fire? And I was like, thank you. <laughs> but some of them were very, very upset um, and they wrote amazingly because of it. Um, for teachers, the feedback, uh, this, the first point is my point, so this is just really for me. This is the burnout that beats all previous burnout. Um, I remember when I was a new teacher, people would tell me, just be careful, you're teaching too many hours. Um, I was teaching at three schools when I first came out of the, the MATSL program, and I was like, what are you talking about? I'll never be tired, but this um, remote teaching, I finally realized and knew and learned really hard what burnout is. Um, Zoom is hard on your eyes, it's hard on your body, it's hard on your brain. Um, sitting in the same position for three hours, that's how long our classes are. It's like you feel like you have been locked like the Tin Man in the Wizard of Oz and you need to be oiled up because you just like can't move. Um, and I think that I just felt so tired all of the time. Um, if I had my way, I would suggest um, not doing three hour synchronous classes. I would do maybe like two hour synchronous and one hour asynchronous. But of course, I don't have any power, so I can't suggest that. <laughs> but if you do have the power, I think that that's a better plan. Um, the pace, again, it was slower than usual. So you just felt like every day, um, here's my plan, here's my agenda, and I'm not meeting it every single day. And I kind of just got to the point where I said to myself, you know, it's okay, just do your best with what you can do. Um, teachers felt very strongly that we were at the mercy of tech and I actually do think that's true to an extent because if your audio isn't working for a listening plan, you just can't do it. There's nothing you can do about it, you have to change. So planning took more time because we had to come up with a lot of different um, contingency scenarios in case something didn't work out. Um, but you know there was also this feeling of among all of these negatives and these challenges we were kind of optimistic and proud of ourselves and and really supporting each other um because we learned and we adapted and in my faculty we had like a discussion board in our course management system just about our daily lives like what are you doing what are you up to how are you spending the time um, so that was our way of kind of keeping in touch with that human side because you get used to seeing your colleagues in the office and when you can't anymore, it does kind of take a toll. It makes you feel disconnected from everybody, even your, even your good work colleagues. Um, and the last point I do want to just mention is we were really glad we didn't have to get sick. Um, I think that sometimes when you're working, it's easy to forget why you're in this, this situation that you're in. Like there is this pandemic going on. And so we should be grateful that we really didn't have to go to work and have to get sick. I think it's good to keep that in mind and keep some perspective. Okay, so I like this picture because I love water um, and blue and green. Those are my favorite colors. But just this idea of reflection, it's kind of refreshing, right? So um, at the end of the semester, I was lucky enough to get a pretty long break. It was six weeks. Um, I was working, I was writing uh, curriculum for the summer classes and posting it in our in our management system. But I was really able to kind of take a step back and to think like, what did we just do? What happened? How did, how did this happen? And what did I do right? And what did I do wrong? And what could I have done differently? Um, and I think that it was really helpful for me to do this process. Part of it is because um, in my master's program, which is at the new school, um, we, we study what we call reflective practice, and you probably know what that is, but I just really like this definition. It comes from Scott Thornbury, 
And he says, when you reflect on your teaching, you think back on, sorry, I can't see this part. <laughs> think back on it in order to understand it better and to take steps to improve it. Reflection is seen as a key stage in an experiential learning cycle that also includes planning, action, and learning. Reflection involves more than simply remembering. It means being able to think critically about experience, to identify problems, and to reframe these problems or to consider them in a new light in order to identify pro possible solutions and to formulate these as a plan of action. It is claimed that self-directed reflection of this type is a characteristic of professional expertise. And I really agree with this. It's like at the heart of, of the way I think about teaching. And so um, funnily enough, what I started thinking about was my teaching philosophy. And I'm kind of laughing because um, the teaching philosophy is part of my um, review process. So I'm always like, oh, I don't want to look at this. But I actually did go back and look at it after all of this, these things that happened to see if I was really doing what I thought is right for teaching. And so I would encourage you to think about um, as you go back to, to teaching uh, the next phase of your classes, think about what is important to you as a teacher. Um, and so I'll share some of the points on my teaching philosophy, what I think is important, but I'm not trying to suggest that this is like the only way to teach, but I think it's important for us um, as professionals to think about like what is actually important to me and how can I put that out in my actual pedagogy. Um, so what these are the points that I think are important. Um, the first one is that I want to facilitate communication. Um, giving a webinar like this always feels totally unnatural to me because as a teacher, I'm not the one who's talking. I'm like kind of walking around and monitoring other people and asking questions. But um, I, I thought about it. Was I doing that in my Zoom classroom? And I think I did a pretty good job. Um, I do think that you have to lecture a little bit more in the Zoom because you have to give clear instructions and there are many questions that will come up that require you to jump in. But you can use the breakout rooms and you can call on students um, who are not actively participating if you have that nice uh, rapport with your students or if you establish it from the beginning. And using the gallery view where you see everybody like the Brady Bunch, you can kind of just go through it in a rotation that the students don't really know that you're doing that, but you just call on them if they're if they're not participating. Um, you can also use the chat to get them to participate and communicate, and you can ask students to paraphrase each other. Um, so if someone's not participating a lot, you can say, hey, can you put what he said into your own words, and do you agree or disagree? And I think that that is something that, um, you know, no matter what, I want to keep the communication alive. The second thing is really to promote critical thinking. Um, so you want to continue to do this in your lesson planning, even though it might be different or even uncomfortable in the Zoom room. Unfortunately, an ice cream truck is parked out front of my house, so I hope you don't hear the music. <laughs> but OK, good. <laughs> I hope not, but um, it'll, it'll leave soon. So one of the ways that you can promote critical thinking in the online classroom is using flipped classrooms as much as you can. You can give um, any lengthy readings or listenings before the class or give them background information before the class, have them work on something and then come to class and actually use the knowledge that they learned at home. Um, so it's the online environment is really good for working on projects in groups. It's really good for having problem solving and uh, uh, using real world applications as much as you can. The third thing is the balance of fluency and accuracy. And in our program at the ALP, we really do like to give a lot of error correction. In the Zoom environment, though, I've kind of slowed down on that. And I think it's really important to just boost the fluency as much as possible so that you get that feeling of rapport with your students. Um, you want to encourage them, I think, more toward the fluency side in, in this type of instruction. Um, the fourth thing comes from my colleague Francis Boyd, who always reminds me or anyone else that we teach individuals. We don't teach a mass of um, people who are all the same. And I think that especially in, in 
this environment, we need to keep that in mind. Um, some people might be really easily adapting to the remote instruction, some people might not. And so we have to kind of do our best to meet with our students, communicate with them, uh, maybe even do a needs analysis. How are you feeling about this? What do you think is going well? What do you think could be better? You know, we can ask them questions. And the last thing is um, for, for teachers, never stop learning. Um, so yeah, you know, we want to keep up with the professional development. We want to come to the webinars and do the trainings, but I do, I do also want to caution not to do them all. Um, some of them might not apply to you, but if you find one that looks interesting, I, I think now we really have the opportunity to do a lot of free professional development and it can be, um, inspiring and invigorating to our practice. Um, yeah, so that's what I think is important. And again, I would urge you to think about yourself and how your philosophy can be reflected in the online world. And that leads me to um, summer 2020 right now. So we just started our summer classes at the ALP. And I wanted to think about like what I would bring with me into the summer. And so for me, these are the takeaways. Um, again, they are not the only ones, but they're the ones that I think are are the best. So having an agenda, setting that agenda, um, what I do in my like nitty gritty uh, setup for the classes is we use a course management system called Canvas and I make a page or it's like a web page for every single class that I'm going to teach. And then I share that screen with my students. And on that screen, I link every document or every file or every video that we could use. But at the very top, I always put my agenda. And um, like I, to I told you, I've now gotten into the habit of doing this. It was something I always wanted to do and never did in real life, but now I do it. And um, Gabriel Diaz Maggioli, who's one of my uh, former professors and just a really awesome presenter, if you ever get the chance to see him, I highly suggest uh, attending his webinars. He says that agendas are a pathway to follow. Um, as useful metacognitive tools. And I actually think that that's true because you can review using your agenda. Um, one of the webinars that I did for, for work training, which was done by um, Zach Kornhauser, it was about group work. And it says that if you're gonna have group work in the online world, you need to have extremely clear tasks and set roles as much as possible. So if you have three people working together, one of them could be you know, the recorder of information, one of them could be the grammar um, person correcting the grammar, and one of them could be the vocabulary person. Um, and that's just one example, but as much as you can give them roles and clear tasks, that's gonna be um, giving you better results. And so for all of my summer co courses, if there's a group um, component, I have developed worksheets that they should fill out together so they know exactly what they need to do. Um, that way you don't like pop into a breakout room to check on them and they're like, we don't know what we're doing. Um, so as much as you can do the roles and clear tasks, it will help. Um, again, distributing mater materials, um, as many different file types as you can provide or as many different ways as you can provide the material, I would suggest that. One thing I was thinking about was like, um, if you give a reading, you could maybe even give an audio component, but that would require teachers to actually record themselves probably unless the, the ebook exists, um, or sorry, the audio book. But it's something I'm thinking about because, you know, some people might feel more comfortable having the audio support. So as much as you can do to vary the mode that the students receive the information, I think if it's uh, within reason, it's good. With tech, um, right now there are a lot of different uh, resources available. I went to a, a webinar about this really cool thing called Pear Deck, Pear like the fruit. And it's something that you can um, use with Google G Suite. And you can get students to do multiple choice questions on the computer, they can use their phone to do it. Um, and it sounds awesome, but for me, it's like, I don't know if I would try it just because I don't wanna mess up anything in, in my classroom. So. If it makes sense, use the tech that you're now seeing explode. If it doesn't make sense, I would say just do what instinctually you know works. Um, it's funny that I'm saying this, but you should slow down your speed. I feel like I'm rushing right now, but it's okay to slow down in the classroom. I think 
we get into this content trap where we think we need to cover as much as we can. Um, and I'm reminded of something that I heard from Leslie Painter Farrell. And she said, you know, we are working with brains. We are not working with content. And we do need to think about processing time for our students. So it's OK that we need to slow down. Um, guest speakers. This is something that I'm just going to mention because, you know, a lot of New York City is totally shut down. And so for my summer courses, I just started shooting out emails to museum directors and different people who work um, in different specializations that went with the content of my summer courses. And I never thought anyone would respond. And we ended up getting a lot of people who said they were interested in doing a Zoom um, guest speaking session with our classes. And so I think that that's something you could you could easily incorporate into online instruction. Um, it gives your, your students a kind of like lecture and Q&A experience. And why not? Now's the time to reach out. Um, another thing I'll take with me for sure is online meetings with students. So um, I have a five-year-old. It's really difficult to manage like staying late on campus um, to meet with a student and then going pick it, to pick up my son. And so it's like, uh, yeah, I'll meet with you online anytime and I can meet with my students for 20 minutes and it's very easy. I don't have to commute. And so I think that now that we're all used to that, I will take that um, practice forward. And the last thing I'll mention here is just um, Try to think about democracy in your classes or how to make your classes more democratic. If you can poll your students or get them to um, use that chat function as much as you can, I think it's a great thing to, to bring forward. I found Zoom to be very kind of democratic in, in that way. And with the other things that are going on in the world today, um, the protests for equality and Black Lives Matter, I think the more democratic ideals that we can bring into our own classrooms, that's kind of what people want, especially the younger generation. And so anything you can do to promote that, I think is great. And so I think it was almost exactly 45 minutes. Um, this is the bibliography with links, except for the Kornhauser, which I think is not uh, public and I don't know if it was ever recorded, but if hopefully you can check out some of these talks. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Brittany. Thank you very much for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, let's wait um, a couple of minutes. Well, let's wait a little bit of time so that the uh, presentation catches on to the live sure. uh, Facebook uh, feed. And we'll see if anyone has any questions. Please, guys, if you, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat so that I can relay them to Brittany. So far, we have Lorraine Rotter. Uh, she, uh, she says, when you spoke about the gallery view to see the audience, I totally understand the feeling of not being able to see the students, uh, or in this case, the people following the talk. It is a strange feeling, not pleasant at the beginning, mm -hmm. but you get used to it. That's what she comments, okay? Yeah, I definitely agree, you get used to it. Um, but I think like, for some reason, I always had it on speaker view. And then I once I learned, oh my gosh, gallery view, it's, it's at least if you have four of your 10 students with a video on, you can at least kind of see them. So I just prefer that gallery view. But yes, you do get used to it. Yeah, I, ha I have some questions. Um, sure. You spoke about the survey uh, that Columbia shot out to the students. How mm -hmm. many students were surveyed? I mean, they sent it to every school within the university, but okay. I think the response rate was kind of low. I actually forget exactly the number of the response rate, so I don't wanna misquote, but I think it was like about under half of the students actually took the time to, to do the evaluation, um, but they sent it to everyone. Okay, very well. And um, also, did your school try out any other tools besides Zoom before deciding on, on this tool? No, um, we actually at the School of Professional Studies, we were all kind of already trained, um, not to the full extent, but we, we had already been using Zoom as a kind of meeting tool because space is an issue at our actual um, school because we don't have that much space. So to meet with people, it's very useful. And so we were all using it for that kind of capacity, um, just to hold like committee meetings or, or other things like that. But we didn't try anything else. Um, I know there are other things that exist, like I think it's called Big Blue Button. Um, and my son uses uh, Google Meets for his classes, but um, 
we didn't try anything else. Okay. Lorraine uh, replied to your comment and she says, of course, mm -hmm. I totally prefer to see the students too. Uh, yeah. A wonderful colleague of mine, Liliana Lisset uh, Yanas, she asks, do you happen to know if there is any other platform with break room function? Yes. I think the one I just mentioned, Big Blue Button, is what you can use in Google to uh, accomplish that function. I, I'm pretty sure. But I, again, I have only heard about this. I haven't used it myself. OK, very well. Uh, Marie Oriu, another wonderful colleague of mine, she asks, well, she says, thank you for sharing. And uh, would you say flipped classroom is an option? Did you get the opportunity to try it? Uh, yes, I think that flipped classrooms are great. And actually, the, the summer courses that we're doing in the intensive program, um, it's like the maxi version of flipped because it's project based language learning. And so um, the students are really doing a lot of flipped classrooms every day and the whole course is built around this final project that they're that they're leading to and it's been working very well um, the other thing that I usually use flipped classrooms for is the course I'm teaching right now which is called advanced academic preparation and it's all about um, research writing and so they do a lot of reading at home we hold seminars in the class and discuss and the flip classrooms uh, allow you to just cover more ground, I think, in, in the online context. But I, I think they're great for a variety of reasons. OK. Uh, Gabriela Osornio, another wonderful colleague of mine, she asks or she says, you mentioned how hard it is to assess students this way, but you had to anyway. How did you assess those who were having trouble connecting? Yeah, I mean, um, so again, those technology gaps were apparent and we did have one student in, in the um, intensive program who was a mom and she had two kids and the kids were trying to do their online school at the same time. And so sometimes she was doing um, classes on the phone with Zoom. And as you know, that's going to reduce your screen size to a really small um, amount. So in that case, you know, there were only five students in that class and, and I know that before a test, we would really try to tell her, can you please schedule that you have the computer? But we do, I think there was one experience where another of the team teacher, um, she had to take it on the phone. And so we kind of just gave her some extra time in that case because it was really, she had no other option. Um, and so it goes back to that idea of like working with your students as individuals, being flexible. Um, and I will also mention that for assessment purposes, my um, department, the, the coordinator of curriculum and assessment, put together some guidelines for us as teachers that gave us like step by step, how do you do a listening? How do you do a reading? So we were lucky enough to have that. Um, we weren't just left kind of, you know, flying away in the wind, but it, it was very, very difficult. And um, we were we were actually shocked. I gave a reading assessment and I was shocked that the students completed it. So again, I would also say like, have some faith in them as well because they, they will be okay. It's just nerve wracking to set up and, and feel that kind of disconnect from what we're used to. Very well. Uh, Liliana says, thanks for answering. And she asks a further question. She says, did you ask students for any self-evaluation at the end of the course? If so, could you share it with us? So for the intensive program, um, I was on the team of teachers. I was the three hour person, which means I saw them the least and I did not um, implement any self-evaluation with them. But in my writing class, um, instead of giving the final exam that I wanted to give, what I did was I gave them um, four short writing tasks to complete one in each genre of of the essays that they had written. And then the last one, the fourth one was um, a reflective writing where I gave them a few of the things that, um, a, few, a few different reflective questions like, what was difficult for you in this class? What was easier? How do you think you um, did with the switch to online teaching? What do you wish had been different? Like these kinds of questions. And so they, wrote for me um, kind of two to three paragraph responses. And I actually was really happy I did that. It was my colleague, Christopher Collins idea. 
And I found out like, okay, so the impressions that I had about the students actually matched up pretty well with, with what they thought of their own performance in the class. Um, and I would highly suggest um, giving reflective tasks at the end of the course uh, for any course that you're teaching, whether or not there's kind of chaos in the middle of the semester. I think that it's a lot of useful information. Very, very well. Thank you for your answer. Um, she asks another question. How did you manage to provide feedback? For the writing task specifically? Um, on a reflective task, I, I would not um, go into grammar or vocabulary or, or development, but I did write back to each student. Um, I, so I learned also over this whole situation how to use my iPad as, you know, like for correcting essays, which sounds crazy because I waited so long, but um, I actually in, in that class wrote to each student kind of like a final letter because we had gone through this experience together. Um, but I don't know if that was what the actual question was about. We'll, Maybe we'll it's see a if, diff uh, different type of feedback. We'll see if she, uh, if she uh, replies. As of right now, she yeah. says, thanks, great idea about reflective writing, a double purpose tool. Yeah, I would agree, double purpose. <laughs> okay, let's wait to see. Uh, Lily, if you're listening. No, I don't see anything. Lorraine Rotter says, I loved when you said that as teachers, we should have some faith in students. Totally agree. And just like you said, they are individuals. And within this situation, we have to be very flexible and try to take mm -hmm. into account each personal situation. Yeah. High five. <laughs> <laughs> Gabriela Sornio says, thanks for answering. I have another comment. I'm teaching a writing composition class and it is especially challenging to keep them on task while on Zoom. We usually work on Google Docs for me to be able to check on the progress since we're required by the university to work in a synchronous way. Could you share how, mm -hmm. how you do it? Um, so with the writing class, the what I actually did, and I don't know if you're allowed to do this based on your university, but the all of the in-class writing like exams or, or schedule that we had, I moved those to be um, asynchronous simply because we had students who were in California, in South Korea, in China, in New York City. It was just it, like it wasn't going to be a fair assessment because people, some people it would be late at night and some people it would be early in the morning. Um, and so to kind of like get back to some of that in class um, time, what I, what I ended up doing was putting them into small groups and having them work on like for instance um, concession refutation they were doing that together. And so they would be in a breakout room and they would have a clear um, writing task. This is what I want you to, to address. And they actually wrote a concession refutation to the letter that we all received from the president of the university telling us that classes were going to um, stop in person. And uh, that worked really well for me because since they were working in groups, they had to um, actually do the work and stay on the task and they kind of managed that for each other. And then I was also able to check the, the instructional focus, like, are you getting the grammar of concession refutation? But again, it, it depends on what you're allowed to do for your university's rules. So wherever you can try to give that, that group element and you could also give some different roles in that task, like I was mentioning before. Very well. Um, I don't see any more questions or comments. Liliana says, uh, thanks, yes, referring to whether you answered or not. Her, her oh, okay. uh, question before this, Good. Thank this, you. this one. So she says, thanks, yes. Um, I don't see any other questions. Guys, do you guys have any other questions, comments? Let's wait just a quick minute, see if anyone. Sure. And as of right now, I guess, you know, um, I can say that we have very similar contexts in the sense, in mm -hmm. the sense of what you're saying, of what you presented. Um, just like you guys, we were kind of pushed into yeah. doing this, right, without uh, too much training. Um, but it's, it's very, very similar. I, I found a lot of sim similarities um, regarding what you, what you went through, okay? 
and what we went through. And I'm sure that these similarities are across many different types of institutions and, and yes. um, schools. I found it very helpful. And the rest of this afternoon, I'm going to start thinking again about what happened. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to revisit. And think about your teaching philosophy. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, regarding your teaching philosophy, you mentioned individuals, right? That we're teaching individuals. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. we try to follow a post-method pedagogy from Kumaravadi Velu. I'm not sure if you're familiar, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but he, he, yeah. he has three parameters, right? One being yes. particularity, and that's one that we really pay attention to. We're, we're not, we, we teach individuals, groups, classes at a particular institution, at a particular context, and, and it's something that we yeah. really have to take into consideration. Uh, I, I see one more it comment is. over here. Um, sure. Lee Somerville, she says, thank you, wonderful, a wonderful presentation. Um, Liliana says, I really thank you both. It's been a very interesting presentation. Most of all, a very honest and realistic point of view. Uh, Gabriela Osorio says, <laughs> yeah, she says, thanks. All of my students are in the same time frame. However, I mostly struggle with the copy pasting situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Gabriela also says, thank you for sharing. Uh, well, uh, Brittany, it's, just about seven o'clock, I, I want to thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for sharing your insight, your reflections, your tips. Um, we all, I'm sure everybody found it very, very useful. Um, and I, we hope to have you again in the future sometime. Yes, I hope so. And thank you so much for, for having me. I really enjoyed um, thinking about this and hopefully we can meet face to face next time. Um, so thanks again. Okay, and uh, well, to the viewers, thank you very much for being with us. This is the last uh, talk in this series. When we come back, most likely we're going to continue with a, with another topic or maybe with the same one, depending on, on how the world is doing, right? Because it's, it's day by day, the way we're living right now, with the way the government is feeding us information, with uh, cases, uh, um, having a rebound and stuff like that. I mean, I hope, just as everybody else, that this terrible nightmare goes away and that we can go back to face-to-face -face classes and and just learn from this whole experience. Brittany, once again, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, thank for you. watching. And we'll see you in our following uh, edition. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.